Hello, my name is John Schneider. When I was a kid, I used to visit my grandma Vi in the Jersey Bayshore area, and I'd take 8mm movies of my family and their friends. In fact, I was the family filmmaker. Today I live here, but traded my film camera for video, and recently shot this tugboat in the Shrewsbury River. Welcome to Jersey Bayshore Country. This is where you'll find Raritan Bay, the Atlantic Ocean, as well as Sandy Hook Bay. Where is the Jersey Bayshore? Let's get oriented by starting with the big picture. It's somewhere in here, part of the universe and definitely part of our world. But it's like no place I've ever experienced. And as soon as we land, I'll show you around. Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, February 1778. The war has not been going well for the 13 colonies. For over two years, continental armies and militias have battled the British, with victory nowhere in sight. Now, as the grim, cold months drag on, men are sick, morale is sinking, could the dream of independence be slipping away? Within Congress and the halls of power, whispers of doubt grow by the day, wondering if George Washington is the right man to lead the nation's army. As to General Washington's talents for the command of an army, they were miserable indeed. General Washington has suffered an embarrassing string of defeats. Chased from New York City, outmaneuvered at Brandywine. Two battles he has lost for us by such blunders as might have disgraced a soldier of three months standing. And now endures the worst indignity yet. He has permitted the enemy to occupy the nation's capital, Philadelphia. I fear we shall sink with him. Despite the criticism, as winter turns to spring, Washington spends his time wisely. His men are battle-hardened, but lack the skills necessary to fight toe-to-toe -to -toe with professional British soldiers. He enlists a Prussian military officer named Friedrich von Steuben to give the men a stern dose of European military training. In May, the Army's fortunes take a turn for the better. News arrives that France will join the war on the American side. Fearful that a French naval blockade of Philadelphia could trap their army, the British decide to abandon the city. They march north to safer quarters in New York. Their move forces Washington to take action. As the Continental Army pursues the British, he confers with his officers. Washington is desperate for a victory. Many of his officers are also restless, itching to fight. Does he dare risk a full-out attack on the mighty British and perhaps lose his army? Or should he let them pass unhindered and later pin them down in New York? Washington chooses something in between the Continental Army will launch a partial attack on the British. One of Washington's greatest critics, Major General Charles Lee, will lead the assault in a small town called Monmouth. Today we're going to visit probably the most important historic site in the state of New Jersey, the battlefield at Monmouth, Monmouth Courthouse as it's sometimes called. The Battle of Monmouth was the longest battle of the Revolutionary War. It was fought in June of 1778. So now we're going out to the battlefield 
and join historian and archaeologist Michael Temporaro. The Monmouth Battlefield is located uh, fairly central in Monmouth County. This is the site of a, one of the largest battles of the Revolutionary War where George Washington uh, led the American Army fresh from Valley Forge against the forces of the British Army, the 1st Division under uh, General Clinton. Uh, they fought here uh, almost an all-day battle. It was a running battle in the morning and ended up here and spent the whole afternoon into the evening as one of the largest field artillery battles of the war uh, with uh, over 10 field pieces on each side exchanging fire for over three and a half hours. Uh, the battle took place pretty much throughout a good portion of the park. The park is about 2,000 acres. When you're here looking at it, you have to use your imagination a little bit. We're kind of modern these days with parks and parks means trees, but in those days, this battlefield was all farmland. There were seven farms here. So wherever you see uh, big clusters of trees, good chances are there were no trees there at the time. It was probably under crop. The most common crops in here would have been rye, uh, grains, uh, hay, uh, Indian corn, which is not the corn macabre that we eat today. People everywhere else in the world but here call corn by its correct name, which is maize. Very deceiving ground out here, which is why I think that Washington's ability as a surveyor were important to him in this battle. He was able to read the land probably more easily than most. It would not have been as easy as it is now with the trees helping you to obviously see what is high ground and what is not. This is rolling terrain. If you look across here, you can see how it dips and rolls all the way through to the, to the uh, visitor center. And it would have been covered in crops, which was also would have given you an illusion of elevation. This is the first battle for the American Army after the training at Valley Forge under uh, Major General von Steuben. Uh, prior to that, described the Army as being bunch of farmers who had gotten together to help to fight for a cause. Uh, and they were all trained individually by their prospective commanders and uh, officers, but they weren't cohesive. What von Steuben did when he got here was he gave everybody the same book. He actually wrote the book, literally, for the American Army on how to drill, how to use your weapons, also the orders so the officers and the men all understood each other. Early morning. The British commander, Lieutenant General Henry Clinton, prays that Washington will launch a full out attack and give him the opportunity to crush the Continental Army once and for all. But he suspects Washington too cautious of a man to engage his army. Already intense summer heat shimmers off the farm fields. It was almost impossible to breathe. The sun shining full upon the field. The mouth of a heated oven seemed to me but a trifle hotter than this. General Lee's plan is to surround a British rear guard of about 1,500 men. The intelligence about the enemy, however, is confused. Lee is met with more than just a few British soldiers. Instead, there are nearly 9,000, forcing Lee to immediately retreat. The tables have turned as Washington's plan for a modest victory is on the verge of turning into a full-fledged disaster. The temperature is now pushing 100 degrees. Washington is stunned to see Lee's men fleeing with half of Clinton's troops not far behind. As the fate of his army hangs in the balance, Washington has but 15 minutes to formulate a plan. Without wavering, he commands his artillery to take the high ground. Then he moves men into the nearby woods. Lee forms a defensive line along a farmer's hedgerow their orders to hold their ground as long as humanly possible. 
The hedgerow is a property dividing line between two farms. In this case, it is a simple uh, wood fence and it does have uh, some overgrowth with it. If you were to say there's an epicenter to the battle at this battlefield, it would be about where we are right now. There would have been an initial skirmish right here on this fence line where 2,000 Americans waited for the attack of the British. This area here, probably at its peak of the battle, which probably was fairly close to noonish, probably had about close to 5,000 men fighting on it. It is a, ru a running battle, but when it gets to here, it does turn into uh, a number of fixed positions. There are three primary fixed positions for where the British artillery is set up in the British Army and two positions for the American artillery. George Washington and the main body of the American Army are actually on the far side of the park from us right now. Uh, General Clinton and the British Army are somewhere in the middle, and right where we're standing, just actually just a little bit off to my left, is where General Green and a uh, brigade of soldiers with four additional cannons came to this position about halfway through the battle. And uh, this is what got the British into the crossfire between two art fixed artillery positions. We think of battle and warfare in modern technology and modern terminology. Think of the uniforms. Today, our uniforms are camouflaged to try to blend into the background. In those days, the uniforms were fairly bright colored. You were making a statement. You know, when you saw a line of bright red coats, you knew you were up against the finest army in the world at the time, the British Army. Of the intimidation factor, it is as much a weapon as the muskets they carried. So, the muskets were, did not have a long range to begin with, and on top of which, it can go any of a thousand directions, which is one of the reasons for the tactics of the day. You have those nice straight lines. The reason for the lines is one man with a musket is in danger, but ten, 20, 100, or at one point here in this battlefield, the British line was one mile long. That firing all at once, that's what's dangerous. That's a solid wall of lead. And in those days, it really was lead coming at you. The idea of uh, you know, officers up on high positions trying to direct this is, it's more like a game of chess. I like to say prior to this battle, the British were playing chess, and George Washington was playing checkers. At this battle, George Washington, for the first time, can play the same game. And he can have his armies moving and positioning and jockeying around the same way the British did. The whole concept of an American army, we've been calling them the Continental Army for all, the whole time, it wasn't a single unified force. I like to think of it as, you know, he walked in the Valley Forge with a bunch of individual units and he walked out with one cohesive army. Here also for the first time with the American Army you see not the Virginia line or the Pennsylvania line or the New Jersey men, you see picked units, which means Washington could say to his commander, I want 20 or 30 of your best men from a variety of different units to meet up with an officer to work together as a unit in this battle. So Washington was looking for a victory for himself. He had been on a losing streak for quite a while. He had success early on in the war, of course, at the Battle of Trenton, and later on, again, a few days later, at the Battle of Princeton. But from then on, he's pretty much uh, not doing too well. Some of his other officers in other areas are doing okay, but he himself is not leading the Americans into a victory. The commander-in-chief was everywhere. His presence gave spirit and confidence, and his command soon brought everything into order and regularity. No one has planned for a fight on this field, but fight they will. Clinton organizes a disciplined attack, nearly one mile wide on the Americans' left and right flanks. Surveying the field, Clinton senses a great victory is within his reach, if only he can act fast enough. General Clinton himself appeared and crying out, Charge, Grenadiers! Never heed forming! We rushed on amidst the heaviest fire I have yet felt. Horrible confusion. One could form no idea of what was going on. The crackling of musketry, the dust and smoke. 
than the groans and cries of the wounded. Clinton's impulse is reckless. Desperate to deliver a fatal blow, he pushes his men beyond their limits. The sun beating on our heads. A number of soldiers were unable to support the fatigue and died on the spot. Still, the British succeed in breaking through. And for the second time that day, the Continentals retreat. As the Continentals flee, it appears as if Clinton's strike may destroy a sixth of Washington's army. But it is not to be. The Continental artillery unleashes a series of volleys in the nick of time, their guns spewing iron, hissing from the Rhine Ridge. Clinton responds in kind with howitzers and cannon. And for three hours, the thunder continues. It is the largest field artillery battle of the Revolutionary War. Americans and British alike cling to the sweltering earth, praying for two things, to be spared death and to have a cool drink of water. Washington makes the decisive move. He outflanks the British by placing four additional cannons on Coombs Hill, which permit the Continentals to bombard the British from two directions. Clinton has no choice but to retreat. By 6.30 p.m., the battle is mercifully over. The infantry has not had a chance to really show itself, especially after all that new training. So when this battle turns into an artillery duel, Washington's still looking for that infantry battle. And once the British start to withdraw after the artillery gets them into a crossfire, he finally gets his chance. And he has actually gets two separate skirmishes at the end of the battle where the infantry gets to show what it's learned over that long winter and spring. American troops attacking isn't uh, exactly a common thing for the British to see anyway, but in this case coming out and in regimental order lining up and firing and advancing is something new. That night the British slip away and continue marching toward New York. General Washington declares victory. The Brits on their side they want to keep the Americans away from the convoy. They don't know what Washington's thinking. They don't know what the Americans are thinking. All they know is orders from London. Get your troops to New York. The battle's toll has been heavy. Over 700 men are killed, wounded, or missing. Almost as many soldiers have died of heat and dehydration as have died from battle wounds. The battle uh, stopped, the combatants stopped fighting. Uh, the uh, British faded away during the night. Their goal was to get their troops to New York. They didn't want to win a battle, they didn't want to engage in a battle, but they wanted to rejoin the rest of the British Army, which was in New York City, and they were, of course, coming up from Philadelphia. Now, um, when they left there, uh, they kind of departed clandestinely and they started out about 10 o'clock at night, actually, and uh, by the next morning, they had gotten as far as Middletown. Here we have a wagon train. It was 12 miles long, and uh, it had uh, anywhere from 12,000 to 20,000 British troops, uh, camp followers, suppliers of the army, and a whole retinue of Tories, which were the loyalists to the British side. And they were all coming, they all left Philadelphia, they had cannons, wagons, and they were on their way to New York. They headed out here to Sandy Hook. Uh, the thought was to have ships come out here and pick them up and evacuate them to New York. Why didn't Washington pursue them? Well, there were a couple of reasons for that. One is that his troops were tired. They had fought all day, they had done well, and he wanted to quit while he was ahead. 
and he wanted to head up for New, New Brunswick and preserve the Continental Army. He was afraid to take him into another battle and, uh, and they would be annihilated. And another reason was that this whole Bayshore area was teeming with Tories, loyalists, and they were afraid they would meet a hostile civilian population if they came on in here. But in Middletown, uh, if you come up for Route 35 and you cross into Middletown onto what's King's Highway, which is the route of the British Army, you're going to go up a, a, a gradual hill, and that was called the Heights of Middletown. That was the most formidable barrier to the Continental Army from coming here because the British could have taken up defensive positions on the Heights of Middletown and held them off. Well, when they got over here, they uh, proceeded down King's Highway into what we know today as the village of Navasink, which would look very much like it did uh, when the Continental Army passed, or where the British Army passed through there. And they arrived at, uh, at uh, the intersection of Linden Avenue in Highlands and Route 36, and they walked down Linden Avenue onto what today is, uh, is the park there, Huddy Park, and on over. And they found that, uh, strangely enough, Sandy Hook was an island in those days, and they had to build a pontoon bridge. Now, the pontoon bridge probably ran from around where Bar's Restaurant is now across to Plum Island, where the, where the, uh, the entry booths are to Sandy Hook. But uh, that's how the British Army got across, and it took them five days to load hundreds of ships uh, with their horses, wagons, troops, but they all got away. They went over to New York and they stayed there for the rest of the war. But that's the significance of Sandy Hook, where I'm standing now, and uh, of Highlands and Atlantic Highlands, which we're in now. The training in the snows of Valley Forge has paid off on the parched fields of New Jersey. Within weeks, the word Monmouth is spoken on the lips of Americans with great reverence. The battle rejuvenates the young nation's will to fight. Once again, the nation cheers George Washington as its commander in chief. America owes a great deal to General Washington. He brought order out of confusion, animated his troops, and led them to success. The general has rose superior to he himself. He seemed to arrest fortune with one glance. I thought then, as now, that I have never beheld so superb a man. By turning defeat into a major victory, Washington has silenced his critics for good. He has also given Americans confidence, for the first time, that independence truly lies within their grasp. In three years' time, General Washington will defeat the British in Yorktown, Virginia, ending the war. The American dream of liberty will finally be realized, purchased in part with the lives, blood, and devotion of soldiers who once fought valiantly here on the fields of farmers at a place called Monmouth. There are four things which I humbly conceive are essential to the well-being, I may even venture to say, to the existence of the United States as an independent power. First, an indissoluble union of the states under one federal head. Second, a sacred regard to public justice. Third, the adoption of a proper peace establishment. And fourth, the prevalence of that pacific and friendly disposition among the people of the United States, which will induce them to forget their local prejudices and policies, to make those mutual concessions which are requisite to the general prosperity, and in some instances to sacrifice their individual advantages to the interest of the community. Signed, General George Washington, 1783.
this year's programming is very special. Last year we did 40 episodes. Very popular. Everybody loved them, I hope. Some of them were better than others. I get it. But uh, this year it's going to be fantastic. I'm taking the boat out. We're doing more on the Revolutionary War. I'm going to take you places you've never been. We're going to talk to some photographers about where are the special places that we don't know about. And they're going to give us some tips on photography. My boat is going out and going up the Raritan River. I've never been there. We're going to talk about the Hadrosaur, which is New Jersey's official state dinosaur, which roamed the earth millions of years ago. In fact, it was in the, the Raritan River Valley, which is now Raritan Bay. Uh, my boat's going to go everywhere, and I have a drone that I've learned to fly, and it's going up and it's taking pictures and video of the Jersey Bay Shore like you've never seen it. It's really going to be an interesting season, and I hope you'll join me. There's no excuse not to see it. <laughs> this is everywhere. Last year, we had over, ready for this? We had over a million views. In our Facebook groups, we have over 10,000 members. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you watching these shows and watching my videos and giving me the feedback. Uh, again, some are better than others. I get that. Sometimes I post too much. I get that. But I think you're going to enjoy the show. And I work hard to try to make it good. And I hope that you will contact me and keep telling me how we can improve the programs, what you would like to see, because that's what makes the show special. The things that you want to see are probably the things I want to videotape. So please join me for the second season of Jersey Bayshore Country, and thanks so much for your support.